for getting rid of the Second Amendment in its entirety. And the book asserts that the NRA has become a white nationalist organization. That book is titled Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment. And it was written by the radical historian Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. Her book tells a very different tale about the so-called gun culture in the United States and about how the Second Amendment was, at its core, a solidifying of the rights of white people to bear arms, to steal native land by force, to capture so-called runaway slaves, and to prevent rebellions from oppressed people. It wasn't about hunting. It wasn't about protecting against the tyranny of government. It wasn't about simply protecting your property from criminals and thieves. Sure, those arguments are made by Second Amendment enthusiasts, and they're certainly representative of a lot of people's motives for possessing guns. Hi, I'm Chuck Norris, a black belt patriot. If some thug breaks into my home, I could use my roundhouse kick, but I'd prefer he look down the barrel of my gun. And millions of other laws... It's all well and good to find white action heroes to extol the virtues of gun ownership and how American-y it is to own those guns. But what's the actual history behind the Second Amendment? It's a question we rarely hear discussed in our society, but it is our focus right now. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz is the author of many books, including An Indigenous People's History of the United States, Roots of Resistance, A History of Land Tenure in New Mexico, and Blood on the Border, A Memoir of the Contra War. Her latest book, again, is called Loaded. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz joins me now. Welcome to Intercepted. Thank you, Jeremy. If the United States has a gun culture, what is that gun culture? It's a weapon of settler colonialism all over the world, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Argentina, where settler colonialism was used. But in the United States, by putting it in the Constitution as that sacred document, as a, an individual right, it veered considerably from those other settler colonies. From the very beginning, guns and ammunition were required in the colonies, in Virginia and then in Massachusetts Bay Colony and then Virginia first, that every man, every household had to have a firearm and a certain amount of gunpowder and bullets. And uh, if they couldn't afford that, the colonial government would subsidize it. So... What were they so afraid of, that they had to have all these guns? Because they were on land that they had stolen by burning people's villages down, by killing, raping, maiming, and driving Native people into the periphery, where they fought back and tried to regain their land and also keep them from taking more. So U.S. settler colonialism was really required, the whole buildup of the United States, a white nationalist democracy. Every man a king with land, and of course then institutionalized slavery took hold by the 1670s. Out of these militias, they carved slave patrols as well. So that dual usage, you know, the right to own human bodies and land and to steal them, kidnap people and kill people, really genocide is just written into the very cellular structure of the United States, the Constitution, every institution. And that plus the militarism that lasted from before, during, and after independence and continued until 1890, more than a hundred years of daily, moment-by-moment moment warfare against Native people, at the same time invading other countries, the Barbary Wars in 1806 and 1809, and then uh, Mexico, 1846 to 48. That just continued and continued and then jumped over the Pacific and into the Caribbean and then to the whole world. So the militarism is the key component of it, and only a third of the population even own a gun. And there's a good portion of those who are combat vets. Hmm. The exact text, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, I'm not asking you about 
more recent interpretations by various courts. But at that time, in 1789, when they were referring to a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, what was the historical context and what did they refer to when they were talking about well-regulated militia? Well, they certainly weren't talking about state militias because those were provided for in the Constitution itself. That's the genealogy of the National Guard. But the Bill of Rights, which was came later, the amendments, these were individual rights, very specifically individual rights. So they could only have referred to the existing citizens' militias, but they came to be self-organized. They were very well organized for selfish interest, for their own purpose. The state, the government had no authority over them whatsoever. And uh, this was how the whole continent was taken, was these settlers themselves organized. They, every, every settler, a soldier, they're all armed, they say, out in their fields and everything. And they're they're all well organized, so they could, in, in minutes, you know, call up a, a militia, and um, they knew what to do. You know, it was in their self interest. So, well, what were these militia doing? Killing Indians, <laughs> taking their land. <laughs> yeah. That's what they were doing, and then the land was theirs. And um, the slave patrols were also self organized. It was really every white man had an obligation to keep an eye out, even if they didn't own slaves, to keep an eye out and turn in any stray black person that didn't have a permit on him that he's doing some errand for the owner. And if he didn't have that, then he was considered a renegade, you know, and had to be captured and returned to the owner. Right. You you write in the book, uh, and this is a quote, the astronomical number of firearms owned by U.S. civilians with the Second Amendment considered a sacred mandate is also intricately related to militaristic culture and white nationalism. The militias referred to in the Second Amendment were intended as a means for white people to eliminate indigenous communities in order to take their land and for slave patrols to control black people. Slave patrols, uh, several scholars have traced the genealogy of slave patrols into modern police forces. So we still see the controlling of especially young black men by police forces. It's not just history. It has led up to the exact kind of situation, both militaristic and institutionally violent society that we have now. When you listen and and watch the current debate about guns in this country, what is your critique of the way that the Second Amendment is discussed by opponents of guns? Can you lay out your perspective on that? You know, their arguments are, you don't need a automatic weapon, you don't need an assault rifle to kill a deer. It is so stupid. It was never, ever, ever about hunting. It's never had anything to do with that. And of course, for these gun nuts, you know, they think that is hilarious because they know what guns are for. The guns are kill people. The other argument that liberals make is they create a bogeyman. It's all about money. And it's uh, advertising and sales. And, you know, you could say it's capitalism. Well, of course, everything is related to the evils of capitalism. But it's not all about money. There is a populist base. And it's very large and it's much larger. I consider the NRA the largest and most powerful hardcore white nationalist organization, maybe in the world right now, except maybe for the U.S. government at this point. But they argue that either the gun industry or the NRA are both together in cahoots are the problem. It's because they have so much money and they bribe congressmen. What they do is get these people unelected or elected or out of office through their base. They are a mass-based organization with chapters everywhere in the United States. And they're activists. That is what they live for. They are gun nuts, gun fetishes, and they, they're one-third of the population. 80% of those are white, but 61% are 
white males. That is the constituency. It's like liberals and even a lot of leftists do not want to face the fact that there's this much power. There's been very little legislation ever because as long as it was a nice, secure white republic up to World War II, uh, with Jim Crow fully in charge, legal segregation, redlining and everything throughout the North, it was secure. And then then the civil rights movement, which of course had always gone on, black resistance, native resistance, but it had a great success right after World War II, and that was the desegregation decision of the Supreme Court. That was the trigger. That was the earthquake, the tsunami that set off the new wave of white supremacy. It wasn't really even needed. It always was there, but it wasn't really needed in an organized way as long as they, as they controlled everything. I mean, they, were, they ran the whole government. Southern senators ran the Senate. They had nothing to worry about. So you see this tighten up with the founding of the LAPD, the new LAPD. It was an all-white paramilitary white nationalist police force. It's never really lost that veneer or structure. It's, it still has problems. You know, this is a rebellion. This is a counter-revolution that started, all, I mean, really at the time of the first victory and built up and built up until it was taken over. The NRA was taken over by a gun nuttery group founded two years earlier, a Harlan Carter, a former vicious border patrol agent. Thanks to you, the members and supporters of NRA, no national gun law has passed this year. We will stand together, strong, dedicated, shoulder to shoulder for what is right. And they infiltrated and got the vote and took over the NRA. That's when it became a completely white supremacist organization, and started emphasizing the Second Amendment. Any national gun law, no matter how innocent in appearance, presupposes a still further growth in a centralized, computerized gun control bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. A monstrous invasion of the rights to privacy of you law-abiding and decent people who have never committed a crime and concerning whom there's no evidence you ever will. You write, by the time of its 1977 convention, the Second Amendment Foundation and its lobbying arm, the Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms, uh, which was founded in Washington State in 1974, seized leadership of the NRA. And you state, the Constitution is the sacred text of the civic religion That is U.S. nationalism. And that nationalism is inexorably tied to white supremacy. Yes, we are weird in the world in the United States with this sanctification of a constitution. They built into the constitution almost an inability to change it. But again, the originalism arose with this counter-revolution against black freedom. But it really is an individual right. It was meant to be an individual right from the very beginning. So, you know, it really needs to be abolished. That's what needs to be. But it's not the vehicle that produces the violence. It's the violence that leans on this phony, sacred object, the Second Amendment, to the point that even all these liberal Congress people, you hear them over and over preceding their efforts for gun control by, well, I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment, but... But we have millions of people who are gun owners in this country. 99.9% of those people obey the law. I want to see real serious debate and action on guns. But it is not going to take place if we simply have extreme positions on both sides. But that's ridiculous, you know? What what are they supporting? You know, do they know what they're supporting? And then other liberals like Nancy Pelosi, they argue that it's out of date. And if they think through what that means, it means, well, we don't have to kill Indians anymore. You know, we all support the right of the Second Amendment right to bear arms. She forgets we still have to kill black people, though, apparently. 
and Muslims and Mexicans. So it's really an in- ineffective argument because they, they just go round and round. Well, if you really believe in the Second Amendment, but I've heard it before, they say, oh, these old guns back then, you know, if we had individual right to a musket and plenty of gunpowder, then that would be fine. Oh, but, you know, they killed a hell of a lot of Indians with those muskets. They were good with those things. You know, they had whole wars. People were killed in Europe with muskets. It's not not nothing. Well, and you, you also write quite bluntly, white nationalists are the irregular forces, the volunteer militias of the actually existing political economic order. They are provided for in the Second Amendment. Yeah, they are. If people want that, then they should continue supporting the Second Amendment. But if they want to find out what the Second Amendment is really about, and that takes a historical contextualization because it wasn't even debated at the time. It was already in the um, colonists uh, when they broke away with the Declaration of Independence. They each formed sovereign states. And, of course, the Constitution, seven, eight years later, was to bring them together in a federation. But in their constitutions, they had already put in the mandate for the continuation of these citizens' militias and the right of carrying arms. And Thomas Jefferson wrote the one in the Virginia Constitution and imported it, you know, to the Bill of Rights. So there was no discussion. There was no argument. No one said, oh, should we do this? Is it an individual right? There was no argument. Everyone knew what it was about. What else could it have been for since they had actual state militias and the Army and the Navy in the Constitution? 